Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unheard Stories. I am Lubna Hassania. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We have a very exciting hour ahead with our guest, Daniel Dow, winemaker and co-proprietor at Dow Family Estates, home of some of the world's best wine. The story of Daniel and his brother, George, is one of resilience and perseverance, of challenging the status quo and embracing change. I like to start our event today by sharing with you some interesting facts I stumbled upon while I was preparing for today's event. A few years ago, a group of scientists published an article on the earliest evidence of winemaking in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Evidently, 8,000 year old pottery jars with residual wine compounds were unearthed south of Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. At least that long ago, people from that region cultivated and domesticated the grapevine and drank wine. Winemaking then spread into the southwestern region. And from there, it was the Phoenician traders 6,000 years ago who spread it into the civilizations of North Africa, then further into Greece, Italy, and France. Soon, wine became a necessity and staple for the people. A drop of wine wiped out microbes and contaminants found in their drinking water. Our ancestors did not understand how grapes turned into wine. The process happened spontaneously and their discovery of it was accidental. There was no way for them to know that the skin of the grape itself contains the yeast necessary to ferment the sugar present in the grape. And like any other phenomenon they did not understand, they deemed it a work of magic. They believed that a divine force is responsible for the production of that red drink with magical powers. Hence the birth of Osiris, the god of wine for the Egyptians, and Dionysus, that of the Greeks, among many others. Fast forward in time, according to NIH, the National Institute of Health, some 8,000 different varieties of grapes coming from 60 different species of grapes have been isolated so far. And a work published in Trends in Genetics dated grapes to be at least 65 million years old. So the history of grapes and winemaking is very rich. And today, with all the scientific knowledge we have about agriculture and biological processes, the art of good winemaking is nothing short of magical. My guest today, Daniel Dow, understands very well the deep hidden gems of nature, how to creatively bring soil and climate together in complete harmony and absolute subtlety and present to you and to the world some of the finest wine a palate can relish and never adulterated pure wine. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Daniel Dow. Those childhood years you spent in Lebanon with your parents and extended family were great and happy years. Your father was a successful businessman and you were blessed with a good life. But then things took a sudden turn. Can you share with us what happened on that fateful day in May in 1973 and how it changed your life forever? Uh, so we had a beautiful life. You know, we had a chalet in Faraya. Uh, we summered often in, in, in Beit Mere. Uh, we lived in Hazmi. Uh, we were born in Eshtafi. So uh, it was a beautiful upbringing. Uh, you know, and we have such wonderful memories. And all that came to a halt in May of 1973, uh, when the war started uh, in 73, and the first rocket that was actually uh, sent in Lebanon, uh, which was aimed for the, was that the Ministry of Defense right above us, above our house, missed and came to our house. Uh, our dreams were shattered overnight, you know. Sorry. It's all right. I understand. Yeah. You want me to take over? Sure, sure. No, I can. I can continue. Okay. You know, it's, it's even even after fifty years. Yeah, it's still hard to talk about that. But you know, we we were badly wounded. 
My brother was in the coma for 48 hours. Uh, I was shot in the face, ended up having a shrapnel in my heart, still there today. Got shot in the leg. My sister got shot everywhere. She passed away about 10 years ago. And our dreams came to a halt. And my brother likes to say that uh, that night he went to sleep as a, as a child. But in the morning, he woke up as a man. And, uh, you know, the saddest part was actually to make a decision to leave Lebanon. You know? You know, we had the French citizenship. My mom was born in France. We spoke French at home. My mom really spoke Lebanese with an accent. She could never tell the difference uh, between hate and hate, but we always would laugh at her. And, uh, and we moved to Paris as much as we spoke French and we love France and we love Paris. Those were difficult years. You know, my, my dad ran out of money. The business came to a halt. Um, you know, uh, racism without a question was very intense at first in Paris. I'm sure it's no longer there today. I think the world has evolved, but yeah, we were called all kinds of names. We would get in fights every week, defending ourselves. Uh, you know, it wasn't easy. It was a very hard transition, even though we loved France and, and we were really felt at home. Uh, then we moved to South of France from Paris. And, uh, you know, it, there was, those were beautiful years. It reminded us of Lebanon, living by the Mediterranean, uh, having the beautiful lifestyle, running around the vineyards, driving our motorcycles. Uh, it really brought back the Mediterranean lifestyle, which we show, so love. Every time we, we get close to the Mediterranean, every time we see a pine tree, it makes our heart very happy. Yeah. We hear the crickets at night, like in Lebanon, making the noise. Uh, all that brings a lot of joy to our hearts. And this is why my house in Paso, I've, I've planted about 20 pine trees, because I love pine trees. They remind me of Lebanon. They remind me of the south of France. So um, when we turn 18 years old, um, you know, my brother and I often like to say, that uh, people ask us, how is it that you lived in three continents? We always like to say that Lebanon gave us the heart. France gave us the discipline. Uh, and America gave us the opportunity. And, you know, being, uh, being in France and, and being 18 years old, uh, our parents were struggling with making ends meet, you know, like a lot of Lebanese families selling properties every year, trying to basically keep living until hopefully the situation would get better. In Lebanon, we ended up uh, coming to America. Uh, my brother came first. He's four years older. I followed him three years later. We were both 18 years old when we arrived here. Uh, we didn't quite speak English. I mean, we understood a few words, but we weren't fluent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we needed to make a living. So uh, I attended with my brother at the University of California, San Diego, where he majored in electrical engineering, received his master's there. And I attended the University of California with a computer engineering degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in 1985, we got a phone call from my dad. And it was probably the hardest phone call our dad had ever given. Mm -hmm. He called us and said, I can no longer send you money. We had $20 in our pocket. And I quickly figured out that with $20, you can live about two months by buying pasta because you can buy a packet of pasta for about 30 cents or so. Reached out to a lot of friends, reached out to a lot of family members, saying they could help us out. And actually, everybody said no. So we were literally on our own with $20 in our pocket with tuition that we have to pay for going to UCSD uh, without the ability to work because we were not US citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had to find a way, so it wasn't easy. And I think, uh, you know, one thing you'll hear me talk about later is that soul of a lion that our dad really embedded in us. Yeah. So, you know, this in a lot of ways ignited that, you know, uh, eye of the tiger to want to really survive, the survival instinct that, uh, you know, we had struggled with throughout our lives. So I was able to find a way to get a job. Um, I got a job working 40 to 60 hours a week, uh, developing programming and, and programming with you know, kind of languages, C++, Fortran, and uh, working for a company that uh, did government work, but was able to contract me to the university. So I was legally able to actually work. Mm -hmm. My brother did some, uh, you know, uh, teaching assistant jobs to try to make some money. Mm -hmm. And we borrowed some money from a couple of people and we were able to pay for our college education and and finish our degree. That's great. Thank you. Um, in 1986, my parents immigrated to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're a very close family. We had been through a lot. And mm -hmm. the idea of having my parents away was not an idea we could, we could live with. So they moved to San Diego where we lived. And um, they, wanted, uh, they wanted to, you know, we wanted to find a way to, to take care of them. Mm -hmm. That was really the, the first emphasis of what we did is how do we take care of our parents? Because our parents had been the most wonderful parents anybody could ask for. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, they always loved us, always supported us. You know, some people, you know, live for themselves and take care of their kids, but some people like our parents really live for us. They mm-hmm. live for their family. Um, I had at the time, I was 21 years old, I was offered a job to be the director of the CDI, uh, Compact Disc Interactive for Philips and Sony, mm-hmm. where basically I was going to have to live in Japan uh, and in Holland at 21 years old. And my brother was accepted to get an MBA at Stanford. And then on the side, I had started a small company that uh, computerized uh, co- businesses. We provided computer networking, programming services. I did it alone at first. It was uh, you know, something, an idea that I had that I was attracted to. I was one of the top students at UCSD in the computer engineering department, and I'd had a lot of experience. And very quickly, I started getting phone calls from all over San Diego saying, come fix our computer networks. So I was having businesses like Computerland call us, call me and say, you know, can you come work for us and do this job and do this job? So I had an offer in hand where I had to leave the country to work for Philips and Sony. And my brother had an offer to go get an MBA at Stanford. And we looked at our parents and they were in their early 60s. And we said, well, we can't leave our parents. Mm-hmm. So I went to my parents, I went to my dad and I said, why don't you give me your last $50,000 and uh, you can be my partner and I will stay here and grow this wine, this company so we can be together. My dad, who knew my, the, the, the extraordinary skills my, my brother had in sales and marketing, said, I'll do it on one condition, convince your brother also to do this and the three of us who work together. <laughs> I said, okay. So took some convincing to, for George to abandon his MBA dreams at Stanford. Uh, since then, by the way, he's gone to Harvard the last 10 years and uh, he's been furthering his education because he loves that. George is an ace when it comes to sales and marketing. Uh-huh. So uh, I convinced him to stay and, and do the company with the three of us. And um, we started with a $50,000 initial investment in 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, 10 years later, we took the company public and the company was valued at $700 million I over know. the fifth best IP on Wall Street. Um, and it was really, for us, it was as much as we were proud of the fact that we accomplished that, we were mostly happy because we took care of our parents. Our parents had a chance to retire, uh, be well uh, taken care of financially, and uh, really enjoyed their last part of their lives. And that we're always very thankful for. That is really the main reason why we got together and started the first business we were in. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. Um, uh, all happy endings, right? With a happy ending. Um, right. Struggles in the beginning, but then determination and happy ending. And you talked about that experience in Lebanon that you had to live through. Um, um, I know exactly how agonizing an experience it is to live through wars and killings as a child when you're trying to make sense of the world around you and trying to understand why people cannot just coexist, right? Correct, <laughs> correct. I too was born in, and raised in Beirut, by the way, Daniel, and I had my fair share of the chaos. Yes. Um, now that tragedy with all the pain that it brought and the fear and the uncertainty must have left a big impact on your relationship with your siblings, especially your brother, George. Could you describe that relationship you have with your brother? Yes, we have a, we have a very unique relationship. You know, most people have a hard time understanding my brother and I. Uh, you know, in Lebanon, we visited Lebanon three years ago. People are often trying to figure out, you know, who, who's the mastermind? Who, who's the guy who, who actually does the work? Who, and it's always funny to watch that. But in reality, um, you're right. Uh, seeing your brother close to death is something that creates a bond that otherwise doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even further than that, when we moved to France, mm-hmm. uh, when we used to fend for ourselves because people would call us names, uh, we watched each other's back because we knew we only had each other. Mm-hmm. And I often tell my children, please, I don't want you to go through what I went through to develop a close relationship with your siblings. Yeah. You know that family is always there. You know that family always has your back. Yeah. Uh, so that created a bond uh, that is very unique. Um, both George and I are very similar in so many ways. We, people often describe us as the yin and the yang, mm-hmm. uh, or the left ventricle and the right ventricle of the heart. Alone, we're a lot weaker. Our dad used to say in French, union fait la force, union makes strength. Um, and it's true, uh, you know, my brother and I have the synergy where together it's one plus one equals five. Uh, we both are capable of doing what the other person does, but uh, we both choose to do what we feel more naturally inclined to do. In my case, uh, you know, I, I tend to be the, the visionary behind a product, behind a solution, behind 
creating the, the initial strategy of the company. And George has the incredible vision of uh, masterminding the sales and marketing way of commercializing that product. This is how we've done the first company. This is how we did the second winery, the company that we have right now. Um, you know, I created the product. I still created the product. I make the wines. I created the initial vision. And George is an ace at, you know, commercializing it by hiring the right people and putting it in the market and, and promoting it. And we're both promoters. We both run the company together, but we both have separate roles that don't, uh, you know, that don't, uh, you know, step on each other's, you know, feet per se. We, we work in, in total symmetry together, in total harmony. Uh, and we have a deep love for each other. And I often tell people that hopefully my brother and I, you know, can be role models to the Lebanese people in Lebanon. That realizing that, you know, the more they fight each other, the weaker they become. The more they work together. We all, we're all part of the same family. The more we, the Lebanese people can find each other to work with each other in perfect harmony, the stronger this country and the stronger as a people will become. So hopefully what we've had accomplished. And I think a lot of ways it has. I mean, you mentioned that. Every, every people in, the, in Lebanon suffered with this war. I don't think it's one-sided. Everybody has. So maybe today they can learn a lesson from that, knowing that it only weakened us, that together we're a lot stronger. Yeah. That's so true. Together we are a lot stronger. And one plus one is more than two. I always look at it that way. Um, you talked about your determination to go independently and start your own business and become an entrepreneur at a young age. Um, and, and you told us why and where you got that drive to be creative and be strong to go on your own. Now, after you closed the chapter on Dow Systems, did you just immediately say, hey, this is it. I'm free. I have the money. I can pursue my lifelong dream. Or did it take you a while to realize that? So before even I retired from Dow Systems, which I did at, I think, 31 or 32 years old, um, I had a deep desire to become a winemaker. Um, I started collecting and drinking wine in my early 20s. I was 22, 23, as a matter of fact. I think every house I've ever lived in, I've lost a bathroom or a closet because I wanted to build a wine cellar. Um, but it was around my mid to maybe around mid to late 20s, maybe 25, 27 years old. I don't remember exactly what year that it really hit me one day that I don't just like to drink wine and collect wine, that I had a... I felt I had an aptitude to make wine. And, you know, at first people thought it was a hobby. My family thought it was, okay, he just loves wine. He's gonna make some wine in his garage. Uh, and then when I retired, uh, the day after I retired, I flew to Napa and started looking for land in Sonoma as well. And I actually ended up making an offer on 165 acres uh, right in Knights Valley between Napa and Sonoma, right at the edge, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't meant to be. And uh, I felt I wanted to study more. I wanted, I wanted to make a more calculated decision than an emotional one. Um, so I spent eight years searching the globe for mm -hmm. uh, the perfect terroir for growing Bordeaux varieties. And, and I know I say that in the most humble way. Uh, I think people from Bordeaux, from other places, can look at me and listen to me and say, well, what do you mean the perfect terroir? You know, it already exists. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I took, a, I took an engineering approach to that. You know, as an engineer, you tend to take things apart and rebuild them. You tend to reverse engineer things. Mm -hmm. And to me, the idea was very simple. Um, it wasn't like a thousand years ago, the French appointed a delegation and sent them all over the world to find the perfect place to grow Bordeaux varieties. It just happened to be the best place in France. Mm -hmm. So if this place did exist, what would it look like? That's really the question that I asked myself. And during that eight year period, I searched the globe for what I felt was that perfect place. Now, I can describe to you what I was looking for. Uh, there's a word in French called terroir. Mm -hmm. Terroir describes basically location, mostly soil and climate. Mm -hmm. And um, your soil and your climate is going to determine the quality of your wine. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about soil and climate? Well, history teaches us a lot of things. For instance, you know, we know from a soil standpoint that almost every great vineyard in Europe, for the matter, as a matter of fact, in Lebanon too, many vineyards, are on the same kind of soil. They are on these soils that in French are called argilo calcaire, or in English calcareous clay. Mm -hmm. These are soils that are very unique because you have the clay that gives you color and color gives you texture and gives you density. You have clay that gives you bouquet, nose, which is very important in the wine. You have clay that gives you fat and flesh in the wine, mm -hmm. but clay alone doesn't do it. You need that limestone subsoil, which is very unique because it allows you to dry farm 
or deficit irrigated the vines without watering, mm -hmm. therefore giving a purest expression of what grows in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. uh, limestone in, in the calcareous is going to give you the ability to make natural wines, wines that are not made in the lab by adding tartaric acid and adding all these things to make up for what Mother Nature hasn't provided you. Calcareous is also uh, gonna give you minerality and natural acidity, something that you know European wines and old world wines and older wines, world, world wines like in Lebanon, you know, give you uh, something that goes beyond just food and alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so these soils are very important. And unfortunately, these soils don't exist in Cal most of California. You don't find them in places like Napa or Sonoma or Santa Inez or Santa Barbara County. Most of soils in California are clay, loam, sandy soil, and volcanic soils that are rarely ever found in the old world, which is why a lot of American wines are not accepted in places like Asia and Europe, because they're very much climate driven. They're fruit and alcohol driven mostly. Mm. So, um, so these soils, when I found out that they exist on the west side of Paso Robles or Trobles, how you want to call it, uh, mm. it was a no brainer for me. Uh, it was like, wow, I found a place that actually has European soils in California. Now, climate is very important because, as you know, in places like Bordeaux, you only get two great vintages out of 10. So eight vintages out of 10 don't ripen very well. So this is why they have Grand Millésime. And if it's a Millésime, the vintage is not great, then it's not called the Grand Millésime. So I wanted to find a place that had the perfect climate. So, you know, what is a perfect climate? Well, you don't want to be Bordeaux. But sometimes you don't want to be Napa either because it can get very hot in some parts of Napa and the wines tend to be too jammy, too alcohol driven. Mm -hmm. So when I found Paso Robles, um, I found, we found, my brother and I found the only vineyard in California that's at 2,200 feet elevation, yet only 14 miles from the very cold Pacific Ocean. So the climate is right between Poyac and San Elino. It's right in the middle. So the temperature, the average temperature is in the middle between those two. So we're not quite Bordeaux because we want to ripen every year. We're not quite Napa, you know, delivering 16% alcohol often in the wines and very jammy character. So we're right in the middle. So when I found this climate, it was a no brainer for me. So I, I went to my brother and I said, let's start Dow Vineyards together and let's grow the winery. Now my brother, you know, uh, it wasn't the wine aficionado I was, but my brothers always believed in me and uh, always had a passion for agriculture and really is, is the genius of marketing and sales. So after a little convincing, he decided to jump on the bandwagon with me. Mm -hmm. So in 2007, I packed my bags, I left my very nice home in San Diego in Rancho Santa Fe and uh, went up to Jebel Dao, Dao Mountain, which we called it. <laughs> uh, we bought our first hundred acres uh, and on Dao Mountain. I erected a thousand square foot modular, which had no power and no water the first two months. Mm -hmm. And I planted the first 26 acres myself, obviously with the help of others, but I was out there in the vineyard, planting vineyards. And people first saw me and, uh, you know, to be truthful, I heard all kinds of crazy things. We heard uh, you, you people don't know what you're doing. First of all, this is not a Cabernet region, it's a Rhone region. We heard, uh, you know, you're, not, you're never gonna be able to compete with Napa and Bordeaux. Uh, we heard, you know, go back where you came from. You don't know what you're doing. Uh, we heard, I mean, we heard it all, even though California is a very progressive state where I think people really have evolved, especially in the last decade or two. You know, we heard all kinds of insults. But, you know, my brother and I have had this history where, where we hear these things. It usually means we're on the right track. Uh, <laughs> if I had heard the opposite message, we would have worried. Yeah. So, so we heard all kinds of crazy comments. But we were de determined to show that this place truly belongs on the world stage for Camino Sauvignon. Um, you know, the rest is history, as they say, you know, 10 years later, every critic in the world has basically written that our wines compete with the best wines of Bordeaux and Napa. Um, you know, I'll give you some shocking statistics, which I don't share often, but I'll be glad to share them with the group today. We're the fastest growing winery in America today. We did that within, you know, 10, 12 years since we released our wines. Uh, Soul of a Lion, uh, which is our flagship wine for Dow, has outsold every Napa blue chip in California but one the last two years. Um, we, are, we, have, we have the number one sold Cabernet Sauvignon in the luxury category in the United States today. We have the number two most sold red blend category uh, in the luxury category in the United States today. We have the number one sold domestic rosé in the luxury category in the United States today. Number fifth or seventh most sold Sauvignon Blanc in the United States. 
Um, and I think in a lot of ways, we put Paso on the map, not only nationally, but internationally. We're in 50 states and 50 countries today. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you've been to the winery. Uh, we receive about 70,000 visitors, visitors a year. Mm-hmm. And um, and people ask us, uh, how do you do that? And we'd love to say we're genius marketeers, but you know, at the end of the day, we're we believe that our best message is in the bottle. When you buy a bottle of our wine, uh, we know that as a collector, I know that if you buy a great bottle of wine, you're going to go buy it a thousand times, and you're mm-hmm. going to tell hundreds of your friends about it. If you drink an average bottle of wine, you may you may buy it once or twice. You may tell a couple of your friends, but when you're taken, you know, when you're really taken by a bottle of wine. You're going to go and be the best ambassador. And, and I have to tell you, that's what we've done. I mean, we have uh, received some of the highest ratings any wine we've received in the world by many critics. Yeah. Uh, one of the last yeah. submission to Wine Advocate, which is the most respected critic in the world, out of 30 wines, 21 received 95 points or higher. Mm-hmm. So um, that's put our, 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 you know, our brand on the, on the map, and not just nationally, but internationally. We are number, the number one sold Cabernet Sauvignon in London at Hedonism. Uh, the largest and most successful. We're at Harrods uh, in London. Uh, France, which never orders anything but French wines, uh-huh. has ordered probably close to 700 cases from us in the last year. Um, you know, we're almost every country in Europe. So uh, we're even we're in Lebanon for a while. We still have to find somebody else to get our wines there. But you know, it's uh, it's it's we love what we do. Uh, it, you know, passion is contagious, and really, what we do is about uh, following our passion, and the rest. Takes care of each other, itself. Exactly, it falls in place. Well, yes. let me tell you, your property is absolutely exquisite, Daniel. I've been there. Um, the views are breathtaking. Uh, we saw some of it in the introductory video. I really encourage everyone who's listening today to add a visit to the winery to their bucket list if they can, and check the website for more information and visuals. You will be amazed, absolutely. And there's so much history on that mountain. We can talk about that later if you want. Sure. You and George have, like you said, elevated the whole experience of winemaking. You took it to a brand new level. Um, not only you mastered it, Daniel, the art itself of winemaking, but also you combined it with the natural beauty of that mountain, uh, the cultures, that, the culture that you bring with you, the elegance and the hospitality. Um, you said that you believe in the power of disruptive vision. And I think you, 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 you disrupted, you made, you created the ripple through the fabric of winemaking and Paso Robles and established something unique and unprecedented, definitely. Now, you spent time also picking your special clones to plant. How arduous was that journey to find the right clones for that terrain or terroir? It was very arduous because we ended up experimenting with about 15 different clones. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we moved to Paso, I saw that really only two clones were the majority clones planted in Paso. Mm-hmm. The mo- they were mostly productive clones, which means they produced a lot of grapes, uh, which really did not create a classic Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it created a Cabernet Sauvignon that had more red fruit, um, not much of a tannin structure. So we really wanted to change that. So brought in 15 different clones. Mm-hmm. Ended up getting rid of about four of them. And uh, what we went after is a classic Cabernet, which tends to be more in the blue and black fruit spectrum with a very classic tannin structure that that's really is more indicative of a high-end Cabernet Sauvignon than, than a low-end Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, as, as you said, uh, so first of all, I have to tell you, my brother and I, based on our, our bringing, based on what we dealt with all our lives, you know, we believe that life starts and begins outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, if you never get out of your comfort zone, uh, you're missing out on life. It's risky, without a question. I mean, I remember when I first went to my family and I told everybody I'm going to become a winemaker, um, the comments were, are you crazy? You know, <laughs> you finally have fun financial security. Uh, you're a great engineer. You're a great executive. You know, uh, uh, you know, what are you doing becoming a farmer? We don't have farmers in the family per se. I mean, my, my grandparents obviously own the farm, but you know, we don't. We have engineers, we have doctors, we have lawyers. You know, typical Lebanese, as you know, we, we always go after the, the great titles uh, and the great the great challenges. But uh, I said no. I I, I want to become a winemaker, and uh, everybody, everybody in my family, all my friends said, "You're crazy. You're going to lose all your money because most wineries fail, and you're going to come back here looking for a job." And I had finally received some financial security, mm-hmm. and. Um, I got worried, frankly, at first. I thought, maybe I'm making a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. So I went to my dad, 
the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. And um, I sat with my dad. I, I, I remember like it was yesterday. I sat next to him. He was sitting on his couch. I sat next to him and I said, I'm here, Papi, because I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Shui Ebni, what my son? And I said, uh, I want to follow my passion. I want to move to Paso Robles and I want to create a winery and I'm going to make one of the best wines in the world. My dad didn't even hesitate for one second. He says, mm -hmm. you know, don't look back. I give you courage. Go and don't look back. I'm with Esther Sheila. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're creating something, a legacy for you and your family. Mm -hmm. uh, when he told me that, it was like somebody gave me a booster shot mm -hmm. uh, that I knew I was on the right track. Um, then I convinced my brother, obviously, and, and, uh, and you know, we ended up uh, following our dream and our passion. Um, Sorry, remind, remind me the question, Lumna. I totally forgot the question. I, uh, I started with that. I was asking you about um, the different clones, I think. You had how arduous was the journey to plant all these different clones and find them and isolate them. Yeah, so, so you know, it, it took time because we ended up eliminating some. And, you know, all these things take time because you plant, mm -hmm. you plant a, a clone, you plant a, a vineyard, and you don't really start seeing grapes until three years after. Mm -hmm. And really don't start seeing quality after four years after or five. Mm -hmm. So, you know, planting things, getting rid of them, all that took time. Uh, but I think we're finally at a point after now 13 years where yeah. we understand which clones really grow very well, not just for Cabernet Sauvignon, but for Cabernet Franc, for mm -hmm. Malbec, uh, clones that many times we were the first to plant, not only in Paso, but sometimes in California, uh, that we work with nurseries on. Uh, but, you know, a lot of work is done, um, you know, talking about living outside of your comfort zone. That's what I was talking about. Uh, you know, when, when I moved to Paso and decided to do this, it was totally outside of my comfort zone. Right. I mean, I could have stayed where I am in San Diego, playing golf every day, being retired, and, you know, working out every day and staying in shape. But no, you know, we took risks. We took risks and, and we could have lost everything. But um, living outside of our comfort zone has been pretty much something that is... Uh, our signature based on what we've done. I mean, moving out from Lebanon to France was outside of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You know, moving from France to America was outside of our comfort zone. Uh, starting a company at 21 years old, uh, living outside of our comfort zone. Uh, starting a winery was outside of our comfort zone. So, um, you know, there are rewards associated with living outside of your comfort zone. It's risky. You mm -hmm. could lose it all. But, you know, I've had a philosophy all my life is I don't chase money. I mm -hmm. chase my passion. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that when you chase your passion, I think as Lebanese, we, we often think of, we want to make money. We want to build a business. We want to be successful monetarily wise. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here to tell you that doesn't, doesn't always work. When you chase money, you often don't make money. And when you chase money, sometimes you're not very happy. But if you follow your passion, you will never look back. It's like falling in love. And that is something that, uh, you know, I've always done. I've always followed my passion, be it in the high tech industry or be it in the wine industry. Now, in the wine industry, going back to what you were asking, uh, yes, we've done a lot of work, uh, work that is considered today um, very unique all over the world, uh, pioneered many different techniques into making wine, uh, I've presented them to hundreds of winemakers from all over the world. Um, you know, we found what I call a secret sauce, ways to stabilize color better than anybody, way of extracting tannins to the point of making elegant wines, and I'm making sure that the wines are approachable upon release, but yet are capable of aging for decades, maybe 40, 50, 60 years. Yeah. Uh, created our own yeast from our mountain that today is sold in 35 countries. Created three barrels in France that just match the profile of our wines from the from Down Mountain. Uh, you know, creating a new barrel right now that is seasoned on Down Mountain with French oak that was brought in from France. Uh, we're the first winery to ever launch a unique cork that is guaranteed to never be corked, never have that chemical cotissier, which causes a wine to be corked, uh, created a mold in Europe, mostly for every bottle of wine you make. You know, we're restless innovators and mm -hmm. we will never stop because that's in our Lebanese spirit. You know, yeah. we, we never rest on our laurels. We're always thinking of how to improve things, um, improve, improve the way we make wine. We've also done a little bit of a land grab. So today within a mile radius of our winery, we own about 700 acres. Uh, we started with 100, and we will probably own about 1,000 acres by the end of this year, inshallah. Uh, we're trying to buy properties around. So, you know, we, we, we will never stop just because, first of all, it's our passion. Second of all, it's our legacy. Third of all is because we see the opportunity. Uh, we see the potential of the region. And, uh, you know, we've worked hard on putting it on the map, and we will continue. And like you said, 
the disruption we've caused is not just for Paso Robles. Mm. The disruption we're causing still is actually for the wine industry in America. Because, you know, 10 years ago, people never thought of Paso Robles, Kevin, especially internationally or especially outside of California or in California. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing things today that we've never seen. Uh, yes. People, yeah, people taste the wines and realize that these things are very special. It's like the best of Bordeaux and the best of Napa in one bottle. Uh, for instance, uh, we have a wine that's just received a 100-point Cap de Lyon for, under our patrimony label, which, by the way, I'll, we'll talk about patrimony if you want in a minute. Um, the wine received 100 points already. Two years ago, uh, we sent that wine, a sample, to a distributor in Denmark. Denmark. It's not a big country. Uh, they wanted it really bad, so I gave them a small allocation. They sold it as a future, two years before the wine is out. I got a phone call three weeks later saying, well, we already sold 80 cases. I'm like, wait a minute, stop. That's a third of my production. I don't want it to go to Denmark mm-hmm. as much as we love having our wines in Europe. Mm-hmm. So this is the kind of response we're getting. We even have negociations in Bordeaux, which traditionally don't sell California wines, calling us and saying, we want your wines. And we've given them only a small allocation because we don't have a lot of wine mm-hmm. right now. We're planting another 80 hectares or 200 acres in the next two years, which mm-hmm. will give us a total of about 400 acres planted and 1,000 acres total, hopefully, uh, that we have in the Adelaide district within a mile of our winery. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. That's a great success story. Um, I know that each different kind of wine you produce has an amazing story behind it, Daniel, something that inspired it. Can you share with us a couple of those? There's two that I really like to hear from you, the 1740 and the soul of a lion. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll start with the 1740, you know, uh, growing up in Lebanon, Every Sunday you would ring the bells and, and, and always gives us, give us, you know, like heartwarming to hear those uh, mm-hmm. bells ringing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also growing up in France, you know, many times in villages, uh, we would go on Sundays, they would ring the bells and we loved that. But also a bell has always been a mean to communication, mean of communication in the old world. Uh, you know, if you look back at, uh, you know, 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years ago, uh, the bell was a mean to communicate. It was also a way to, for instance, the bell was rang every day at noon. Uh, so everybody would stop and say a prayer on the Angelus. Uh, or uh, when the Vigno home woke up in the morning and decided he or she uh, wanted to pick the grapes, how did they call the pickers? You couldn't text them, you can't call them, you can't message them on Facebook, you can't email them. Mm-hmm. You rang the bell and people would come over saying, okay, it's time to pick. So we looked for a bell, this very unique bell, for, uh, for a couple of years. Uh-huh. And we finally found this bell that comes from a monastery in Spain where the monastery actually collapsed and they recovered two bells. One went to Portugal, one came to the United States. So we bought the bell, hung it on our vineyard uh, and we ring it three times a year. We ring it at the beginning of harvest, at the end of harvest. And we also ring it on my parents' anniversary every year on February 11th. Uh-huh. And um, uh, we decided to uh, call a special wine after the bell it was actually one of my dad's favorite wines growing up in France. So he loved uh, a wine called Cheval Blanc, a white horse in English. And it's a centimillion blend of Cabernet Franc and Merlot. So when I made this blend, uh, we called it 1740, uh, after the bell, because it has tradition. It goes back you know, a couple hundred years or more. And, um, and this is a very unique blend that I don't make. It's not a big production. It's mostly sold actually at the winery only. It's never sold wholesale, or very rarely sold wholesale. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful wine and uh, a wine that evolved very nicely you know, over the years. Now, the second wine, the Soul of a Lion, you know, we grew up with, I can't say that enough, we grew up with just incredible parents. I mean, uh, you know, Lebanese parents love their children and live for them, uh, something that I do as well with my children. And, you know, as a father, I have five, five children, um, you know, I would go to work four or five in the morning with my first company, I would come back at seven, eight o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, when I would be home at night, uh, after receiving a couple of hugs from my kids, I really wanted to be left alone. I mean, I was exhausted. I, I would have a meal and have a glass of wine and go to sleep. But my dad wasn't like that. My dad would come from working all day long in his business. And uh, we would sit outside on the balcony and all the children would surround him. We'd bring him khiar and labne and hummus and, and it was cheesy. He didn't like to eat a lot at night. And my dad would take an hour of his time every day and he would tell us these stories, how he closed this deal and how he convinced this guy to do this and how he did this. 
we grew up with these incredible stories that always have inspired us to be who we are today as individuals, my brother and I both. So about 20 years ago, you know, we wanted to capture these stories. We didn't want, you know, we, we meet often so many people in this country and no, nothing wrong with that, but it's just the, the, the nature of, of this country. We're, we're a melting pot. We often talk to people and saying, okay, tell me about your parents. Tell me about their parents. Tell me about your grandparents. They know a little bit about their grandparents. Tell me about your great grandparents. 99% of the time, it's like, we don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. so I was brought up being told, Ismak, Daniel, Joseph, Halim, Yusuf, Habim, Khail, Tanuzdao. Going back six generations. So I know my ancestors with their, with their names and I know stories about them. So I wanted my children and my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, and the future generations to never forget Aslan. Mm -hmm. And the Arabi mean Nakar Aslan, Aslan. Mm -hmm. you know, who designs his, 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 uh, his ethnic background has none. You, know, has, has, you can't quite translate it, but you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So we hired these two ladies and we had them spend a year with our dad. And in that book, that ended up being written about his life, um, he shared all these stories we grew up hearing. Stories that really are so inspiring that you know, still inspire us to this day. My dad used to say, uh, you know, uh, I'm a candle that burns for my children. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, that candle is still burning today. We still feel it. Mm -hmm. But uh, when that book was written, the ladies that worked with him uh, asked him at the end of the book, what do you want the book to be called? And with no hesitation, my dad said, soul of a lion. And they said, why soul of a lion? They said, because our family has been up and has been down. We've been down where we had no penny. We were up where we had a lot of successes. And it's happened a few times in our lives. Mm -hmm. But I want my children to remember that anytime they feel adversity, mm -hmm. to remember that inside of them, there's a soul of a lion that comes back roaring all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. So when we made our best wine on the mountain, uh, which is a Cabernet Sauvignon with a little bit of Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot blending in it, um, we decided to call Soul of a Lion after our dad. And um, the wine really incorporates the spirit of my dad left us. It has roared to the top. Today, it's one of the most sought after wine in the world, not mm -hmm. just in California or the United States. And, uh, and does homage to our dad. You know, and as a Lebanese, we honor our family members. Mm -hmm. So many of my wines honor my children or honor my parents. We have Soul of a Lion after our dad, Mayotte. My, my, my dad's name was Joseph. My, my mom's name was Marie. But growing up in a French island, Guadeloupe, uh, she had four brothers and they nicknamed her Mayotte after a small island. Mm -hmm. So the name stuck. So all, all her life, they would call her Mayotte. So we called uh, uh, one of the wines after her called Mayotte. Uh, we made a, a, a wine after my sister who passed away, you know, 10 years ago from breast cancer. Her name was Michelle, but we called her Michaud. So we made a wine called Michaud. Um, my, my daughter, Lizzie, is uh, a whiz at winemaking. She graduated from Cal Poly, uh, received, is receiving graduating this month with three masters from uh, Spain, Bordeaux, and Portugal um, in winemaking and is doing an internship at Chateau Latour for six months this year. Uh, mm -hmm. So I made one after her. She's the first second generation winemaker in our family. I called it Cuvée Lizzie. Uh, I'm releasing a, a bottle of wine called Cuvée Catherine after my oldest daughter um, next year. Um, so, uh, there's still, uh, there's still more, there's three more children. I, I named the vineyard actually after my third daughter who's not expecting my first grandchild. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I call it Gabrielle vineyard because her name is Anna Gabrielle, okay. Anna Gabrielle Maryam to be exact. Mm -hmm. So I'm releasing, I'm releasing, uh, so I called the vineyard after her, which is only a mile from the winery. So we know we honor our family members, uh, something very Lebanese and, uh, and we'll probably continue making a couple of others because I still have two other children. I haven't any, I named anything after them yet. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, you definitely have a solid connection with the family and with nature um, and the good uh, memories that Dao Mountain brings from your past. Uh, I can we can see it uh, as you talk to us, all that passion inside. Um, uh, where will Dao journey take you next, Daniel? Are you looking into expanding the scope of the winery? Yes, yes. Uh, so we'll continue being restless innovators. And uh -huh. there are two projects that are near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start with the first one. Uh, in 2013, you mm -hmm. know, while we were the first winery to really release a bottle of wine for $150, that's Kevin mm -hmm. Sauvignon from Paso, to really take over the market, uh, um, we didn't rest on our laurels. Um, I was able to make a wine that uh, I like to refer to as a rare phenomenon. 
mm -hmm. uh, a wine that has arguably the highest phenolics in the world for Cabernet Sauvignon and Bordeaux varieties. Uh, what I mean by phenolics is three things, color, mm -hmm. nose, and structure. Uh, so those are indicative and are directly correlated with a superior wine. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a fun project. Uh, started very small with about 250 cases. Um, so that was a 2013 vintage, which was released in 2017. This was the first wine uh, from the entire maybe Central Coast that was being sold for 275 to $500 a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, people literally again told us we were crazy. Uh, how can we do that? It's not going to sell. Uh, within literally a few weeks, the wine sold out and had a three-year waiting list. Um, so the project has evolved. Um, the beginning of this year in January, uh, there are seven individuals who worked at Opus One, arguably one of the most successful wineries on the planet. Uh, when they tasted the wines, when they heard the vision, uh, they all quit and joined Patrimony, um, which really sent an earthquake in the wine industry. Wow. Uh, they're veterans in the wine industry. They pretty much built the sales force in California and other places for Opus One over 22 years in one case. Um, but they decided to join our family. Uh, mm -hmm. So Patrimony is a different winery. It's a standalone winery. Uh, we bought a 270 acre piece right next to Dow Mountain. So it is technically the same DNA of Dow Mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are in the process of submitting this year uh, something to the county to approve that the world hasn't seen yet. Uh, it's gonna be a beautiful French chateau that will incorporate hopefully a starred Michelin restaurant, a uh, hotel with eight bedrooms where you can spend the night, uh, a cheese cave, a cigar room, um, you know, uh, incredible hospitality, um, caves, wineries, and uh, planting about 70 acres just for this property this year and next year. Uh, we hope to start construction on that hopefully by the end of next year. So by hopefully 2024, uh, this winery will be live. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that uh, this wine already has sent earthquakes from all over the world. Uh, it's been received in places like Hong Kong, Korea, uh, Europe, and many places. Um, and it is really changing the way people look at, you know, where Cabernet Sauvignon grows best in the world. It really is. Um, and it's actually the first wine, two of those wines received 100 points already. Wow. That's amazing. Now, thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's very really uh, exciting news. It is. It is. And uh, I've been also, another project I'm working on is, you know, uh, we miss Lebanon. We mm -hmm. miss the Mediterranean. And I love Tuscany. It's a region that I visit every year. Um, and I've been looking at uh, buying property there so we can start a winery in Tuscany to make a super Tuscan, which is so the same varieties as what we have right now uh, at our property, but in Tuscany. And actually I made an offer about three weeks ago now. Fortunately, it didn't quite work out, but uh, we know the area we want to do it in. We've been searching and studying for the last three, four years. So I think in the near future, you may see us do a project in Tuscany as well to really expand our global footprint, not just from Paso Robles, but also from, uh, from Europe to really promote our brand and our family's brand all over the world. That's, that's wonderful. I feel so lucky to be in California. <laughs> yes, we love California. Absolutely. I come to you driving. It's very easy. It is. I wish you all the best, Daniel, with all your future plans, really. You make Thank us you. all proud. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, you have Pleasure. a remarkable story, and it was a privilege having the opportunity to share it with everyone today. Can we take some questions from the audience? Daniel, do you have a few minutes for us? Absolutely. Well, all the time in the world, please take okay. your time. Okay. To everyone in the audience, please go to the reactions button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, to raise your hand, and then I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question to Daniel. Um, I have a comment from Manu Kaker. He says, wow, he cannot wait. He's coming to visit you soon. Um, Kamal Shayib left a note saying, um, he visited your winery. The views from the top of the hills are breathtaking, and that you and George were very hospitable, and that you make him proud to be Lebanese. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have to tell you, uh, I'll say this in Arabic, hopefully everyone yes. I can't tell you how many times, how many Lebanese people I've run into the tasting room. And yes. the first thing I say is, you make us so proud that a Lebanese can come out of nowhere and yes. actually challenge the wine industry. And, and you know, to us, that makes our hearts so happy because we're one people. 
And, yeah. you know, we're, we're small, you know, we're not that many of us, yeah. but uh, we have a huge impact on the world. And that's been kind of the signature of Lebanese people, wherever you go. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I think Kamal uh, would love to ask you in person. Go ahead, Kamal, unmute yourself. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Lubna. Oh, hello, how are you? Thank you for yeah. being with us today. Well, thank you for bringing such a great Lebanese people. Uh, so we, so we are, so, so we got even more proud of being Lebanese. Of course. Uh, yeah, Daniel, I, I, I enjoyed uh, your presentation very much. And I had, I had the pleasure to visit your winery with my daughter, Sarah Shuhayeb. Your people treated us wonderful. Um, you know, uh, we had very special treatment and they told us, you know, you, you gave them that instruction. Your place is like heaven. Mm -hmm. what, a, what a place. I mean, really, you know, you look from up, down, and, and um, you know, what's God's creation? It's such a beautiful place. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we are very, very proud of you. Thank you very much. You are a role model for all of us. And uh, we look forward to meeting you in person sometime. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I really enjoyed meeting your daughter. I met her in Lebanon 2018, where we have a common friend, Faisal. And you should be very proud. Your daughter is, is very intelligent, very smart. And uh, she does a great job for presenting the Lebanese people as well or His Excellency, our Ambassador, Jean Macaron, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, Lubna. Hello. What hello. you said about, uh, about Daniel, it is indeed a remarkable story. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, uh, uh, what you said about your life and experience is beautiful and very interesting. And uh, you should be proud of being a great farmer. Uh, my <laughs> question is the following. My question is the following. Uh, you know, uh, production of wine is a combination between four elements. It is soil, sun, grapes, and expertise. Uh, which one, in your opinion, is more decisive to make a good wine? Thank you. Well, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, not an easy one to answer because I think... Uh, even the greatest winemaker in the world, if the grapes don't have the right soil and climate, will struggle into making a great wine. Um, you know, a, a, a great wine is something that's not easy to make. Anybody can make wine. You can grow grapes anywhere in the world and make wine. You know, you can just throw some yeast and forget about it, come back a few days later and it turns into wine if it's grapes. But making a great wine requires a lot of things. And I'm gonna say that, you know, it's very crucial to have the right soil and climate in order for you to really be able to make a great wine. However, the expertise of a winemaker is to tap into this potential and be able to capture it. So let me give you an example. If you drive a Ferrari and it goes zero to 60 in two seconds, that is a great car, but you could put somebody who doesn't know how to drive and they're not gonna be able to drive it well and they're gonna crash it. So the terroir is something that's very unique, but you need the right expertise in a winemaker to be able to work with that environment. Um, so they work together in harmony. You need both. Um, you know, a, a great terroir can still lead you to a pretty good wine, but a great winemaker is going to take this terroir and really tap into its potential. Hopefully I answered your question, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for your question. We have a comment from Honorable Judge Tony Rafael. He says, thank you, Lubna. Thank you, Daniel for sharing your amazing story with us. Looking forward to visiting your winery in the near future. He's a Californian, so he's coming great. your way. Uh, we have a comment from Preeti Marla. She said, great story and passion for wine. Loved visiting your beautiful winery and looking forward to your future projects. Thank you, Lubna and Daniel. Um, anybody else? Any, any other questions from the audience? Oh, you have Nijad Al Atasi. Go ahead, Nijad, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, thank you, Dr. Dr. Feist. Uh, uh, I'm very, very thankful to you. Always, I'm getting your invitation. I'm, you know, enjoying uh, the gathering and the, all the topics and the, the guests. I mean, who you brought in, Daniel Masalche, Mahaba Daniel. Daniel, I'm, I'm half Lebanese, half uh, Syrian. My mother Lebanese and my father is Syrian, and I'm living in Bahrain. Um, and I'm very concerned. I mean, I'm really your, your speech and your presentation very inspiring. And but most what concerns me is the family relation. 
I mean, this is very important for me and very touchy because you don't find it everywhere and in every family. But what you talk about it and your relation with your father and your mother, and this is this touch my heart because again, for my father and my mother who both passed away. For really just, I mean, I'm, I'm not asking a question, but I enjoy your presentation and thank you for Dr. Alubna and to, to bring you. And I hope to see you in Bahrain, but let me quote you a small thing. The heart that loves is always healthy. The heart that serves is always happy. The heart that cares is always strong. And I pray for you and for us and for everybody. God keeps you healthy, happy, and strong. God bless you and good luck in your endeavor and good luck Dr. Lubna and I will keep in touch inshallah. Thank you. Ahlan. Thank Ahlan. you so much. Beautiful words. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Habib. indeed Thank beautiful. You. Uh, Monsieur Joseph Mahoun, our honorary consul in Tahiti. Go ahead, Joseph. Unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. <laughs> when, uh, when we speak about one, we have to speak French. And well, Francophone, you know. Creole aussi, no? <laughs> et, hi, Daniel. Et, et J'ai vu aussi que vous parlez français. C'est pour ça que je suis heureux d'exprimer, de, quand on parle du vin, parler en français. Oui, c'est super. Moi, je, suis le, je suis le consul honoraire à Tahiti. J'ai eu le plaisir de goûter votre vin euh, en Californie et même grâce à Lubna. Euh, notre consul à Paris, elle s'appelle Lara Dao et j'ai eu le plaisir de lui offrir ah. une de vos bouteilles. Excellent. Ah ben c'est bon. <rire> et je suis de Batroun et Batroun, on a d'excellents vins. Beaucoup d'étiquettes aujourd'hui à Diarc, Batroun oui. Mountains, euh, et, et aujourd'hui sont classés parmi les meilleurs. Et Exir, Exir, vous avez vu The Best Rosé in the World. Oui, j'ai vu ça. D'ailleurs, j'ai visité Exir en 2018, et je ne sais pas si vous savez ça, mais bien que notre famille est d'origine de Batroun, de, pardon, de Houmeil Abdedoun, l'origine de la famille Daou, c'est de Batroun. Voilà, il y a la famille Batroun, je me souviens quand j'étais petit, la famille Dao et Akel, qui voilà. étaient les deux grandes familles de, de, de Batroun. Voilà, en tout cas, je suis très heureux, je remercie Dr Lobna, qui, qui est une femme merveilleuse, et elle nous donne l'occasion et le plaisir de rencontrer beaucoup de personnes. J'ai vu l'émotion quand vous parlez du vin, c'est très touchant, et je suis heureux et fier. Merci Lobna, thank you Daniel, very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. Um, I have one more note that I like to read from Dr. Abdullah Nasruddin. He's our economic attaché at the, at the embassy in DC. He says, thank you for the invitation, Lubna. Another great story of the Lebanese around the world that makes us proud. The story of the Brothers Dow show that success needs love and is transferable across sectors, whether computing or winemaking. So true, so true. Thank Daniel, you. it was a great pleasure having you. On it was show. truly a pleasure, and you're, you're, this is one of the best interviews I've ever gone through. Oh, thank uh, you. You're, you're really in depth. Uh, uh, obviously, your questions were very much to the point, and uh, you know, you, 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 you really portray passion toward what you're doing, and that goes a long way. I do. And very smart questions, so you make us all proud of you. Thank you, thank you. you. You do too. We're all waiting eagerly, eagerly to see what you and George are going to be creating next. Um, please give our best to George. <laughs> I will. I will. He, he hurt himself. He had to have surgery with his shoulder, so he's recovering, but he's doing fine, uh, which is why he couldn't attend today, but uh, I will be sure to relay that. Okay, sorry to hear that. Well, uh, to everyone else in the audience, we are so grateful you joined us today. Please don't forget to connect with us again. Unheard Stories is a monthly event. It falls on the last Saturday of every month. Our next episode is scheduled for Saturday, Ju July 31st. And my guest is Anthony Rahayil. Anthony is a dental surgeon by profession. He's also a published author, professional photographer, hospitality blogger, YouTuber, influencer, and TV presenter with hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. He is Lebanon's most famous food blogger and founder of No Garlic, No Onions food blog. Anthony's energy and enthusiasm are infectious, and his love for Lebanon takes him around the world to spread the real image of authentic and amazing Lebanon. You would not want to miss it. 
Please find the link to register for the event in the chat box. To watch past events and know about our future ones, you can follow me on social media. Thank you all for bringing us into your home and making us part of your Saturday. Goodbye for now. Bye, Luna. Bye-bye.